Well, I often say how uh, Julie Andrews is a metaphor for my identity as an artist, uh, even as a man somehow, and I'll, I'll explain you why. Um, it all began when I was a child. I can't remember exactly how old, how old I was. I must have been eight or ten. And I, I was a soloist in the church choir in, my, in Palermo, which is where I was born and where I grew up. I used to sing every, every Sunday in the local parish. No fancy cathedral, no Vienna choir, boys choir, nothing. We, I was never taught music as such. And so, you know, it was just me and my school friends with the, with the local priest conducting the choir. Nice little praise the Lord sort of Sunday mass kind of thing. Um, so everything wonderful. I was the I was the soloist. I would sing my solos, lovely. One day the priests took us to see a movie which I don't recommend any child should see because it, it perverted the course of my life. That film is Mary Poppins. <laughs> it's a movie that um, to me has a lot of um, subtext, which um, I certainly decoded in a certain way. That movie changed my life. I was eight or ten, and um, I saw this um, wonderful creature who, who uh, was an alien who would come and disturb the uh, the normality of the family of the Disneyfied family. She was an anarchic figure, and she sang. She sang beautifully. She had the beautiful soprano voice of Julie Andrews. I didn't know that Mary Poppins was Julie Andrews at the time. To me, she was some sort of an icon removed from an actress who played the role. She was an entity. So Mary Poppins, throughout the movie, she, kept, she keeps on doing things like, you know, and to me, these little nods were like sort of, she was allowing me to be naughty, to do things, to go to extremes. You know, I, I sat through that film and every time something naughty was about to happen, she would go, and that was directed to me. So the following Sunday, back in, back in the church choir, I, while I was singing, I saw Julie Andrews going to me and she was telling me, go for it, do it, sing like me in the film. <laughs> I felt the constriction of the church, I felt the constriction of the, praise the Lord. I wanted to give it a kick and Julie Andrews told me, you can do it, that's the time, do it now. So I stepped onto my podium, I looked at the congregation, Father Cabrini, conducting, Father Manfredi actually was conducting, my mother in the audience there, everybody else so proud, the little boy, oh wonderful, praise the Lord, and, 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 <laughs> and off I go. Mm, Julie Andrews in the film, uh, by the mirror, Mary Poppins sings a Handel cadenza at some point with the mirror, and I did exactly that. Praise the Lord, My mother, Father Manfredi, stumbled on his way to the podium. It was like a, it was dramatic. It was huge. I mean, certainly for me, um, uh, I was told off. There, there, there was a lot of my, my father was called in. I was told off. And I, there was a, there was a subtext in what they were trying to say. They couldn't tell me, but basically, little boys don't sing like little girls. You stick to what. The Lord wants, you, wants from you, which is singing like a treble, not a, a coloratura. And, um, and yes, I was told off as shame and uh, terrifying. My parents actually were quite supportive. They said, oh, don't worry, that old idiot. Don't really, don't, don't care too much about that. Don't, don't, don't worry about too much about that. But I, I, never to do it again. You, next Sunday, you will sing like a little boy for those devilish images. Take them away. And, well, obviously, that's exactly what, <laughs> what they should tell you to make you want to do it even more, which is exactly what I did the following Sunday. I was Mary Poppins bursting through the church and smashing everything around her, like, you know, big voice, big... The, the, the Mary Poppins attitude was even more flaunted. Out! Out of the church, forever, out of, the, out of the choir, forbidden, you naughty, you nasty, you, this, you little devil boy. So this triggered a lot, obviously. Um, 
I guess, uh, because I was silenced, my voice was silenced, that Julie Andrews palpitating in the little boy was shut in a cage. And um, I suffered from it because for about four years I stopped singing in public. Singing for me was forbidden, was, um, was something dirty. I had no idea at the time that I now equaled singing to sexuality. From age 10 to age 14, all of this was developing and I, my voice broke and I was still singing as Julie Andrews <laughs> or wanting to. So whenever my mother would leave the house, whenever I was alone at home, I would put on a record from My Fair Lady or Camelot or the other things that Julie Andrews did, which in the meantime I had got to know more about Julie Andrews. Uh, Julie Andrews had become a woman behind the character that she played in that film. So I knew, I, I got hold of the recordings and, and I would sing along to them. Uh, my mother discovered because the, a neighbour once complimented her, oh, Mrs Tomasini, you have a wonderful voice, Signora Tomasini, but you're a wonderful soprano, I didn't know, I was, but, but, but I don't sing, I, I've never sung in my life. And it was obvious that it was her son who sang as a woman when she left the house. So there was another big thing because I, by now, you know, this was <laughs> our dangerous territoire for a 14 year old. And yes, singing was a private, dirty thing. So th there was this connotation of um, uh, something not allowed, something, something to hide, something that went along with a, with a sexuality that, that was forming that wasn't, in those days, we're talking about the early 80s, that wasn't even legal in those days, that wasn't mainstream, certainly everybody hated you in those days. There was no, uh, if you were different, there was no law that was towards you, there was no image in, in, in the cinema, there was nothing. You know, if you were gay, transgendered or whatever, you were alone and you thought you were, there was no computer to find anyone else like you, so you just thought you were the, the odd one out, the freak that nobody liked, that even the people that loved you most and that you loved most were critical of. So, you know, it, it, was, it was a very lonely and um, difficult time, really. And uh, so I know that some people succumbed to it. I didn't because I had Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews came back with a vengeance <laughs> into my life because in, around that time she made another movie called Victor Victoria, in which she plays a gay man who sings like a woman. Well, she plays a woman who pretends to be a gay man who sings like a woman. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Suddenly there was this image, and then the movie, which was made in 1982, was like, um, even though it was made by Blake Edwards, who was a straight um, a director, it was all about gay liberation. It's, it's incredible, even watching it today, how forward that movie is today. And in the movie, she was a cabaret artist. She was this um, woman pretending to be a man, pretending to be a woman who became a cabaret star. What would you like? Well, that, well, thank you, Julie. That's the answer. You know, and um, that's exactly what I did. I put together, it took me like a few months, I put together a cabaret act, act and I became like Victor Victoria, a cabaret artist extraordinaire, the man with the voice of a woman. And uh, yes, that's what I did. Early on, obviously, um, in the film Victor Victoria stars immediately in a, in a wonderful club, you know, a very posh venue and stuff. But not so much for me. <laughs> I, uh, my, my first, uh, the first venues where I played were, uh, I, you know, the, the only places where I found, so I had no idea about a cabaret scene in Palermo, you know, the, I, I knew nothing. So what I found was a little place by the port with basically uh, pirates and sailors and people like that who would go to it, smoky and like everybody drunk and, um, but you know, <laughs> I was, I thought, yes, that's, that's, that's fantastic. You know, I spoke to the manager and I said, yes, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a cabaret artist extraordinaire and uh, I've got this number and I said, yeah, okay, you know, I'll um, give you this much and go and sing, do whatever you want to do. And I created this little show which, thinking back on it, I think how on earth I had I had three numbers. First, there was a, a, a song by Julie Andrews, which I, one of Julie Andrews' songs, which I would sing in my soprano. Then there was a comedy sketch, little comedy sketch, and then I had uh, a striptease at the end. The, the striptease I developed it later because I, I <laughs> saw that the audience would have enjoyed that. And basically, 
you know, these pirates were watching the boy, who by now was 16, the 16-year-old boy um, uh, in a kind of mini skirty thing. I had leggings on, a bit like, I, I, you know, still <laughs> tied up to my past. And um, so they were just enjoying the kind of um, sexual innuendo that, that I wasn't aware of. I was just singing My Fair Lady songs with, in my soprano voice like Victor Victoria, and, uh, but they were, you know, they were enjoying another aspect. So I added the striptease, which wasn't, I wasn't revealing anything. It was all about kind of, it was burlesque long before neo-burlesque started. We're talking about the, the, the early 80s. And so that I, that's how I started. Now that cabaret venue, which was, th th this little venue became a cabaret venue because they, they didn't really have cabaret before. Um, through friends of mine, uh, school chums who started coming and stuff, this li little pirate spot became uh, the favorite of the elite. Suddenly the boy singing like a soprano, oh darling, he's amazing, you must come and see this delightful. So suddenly, and you know, and this, and this uh, place with pirates and they're always smoking, they, they drink these things, oh, Dali is amazing, you must get so decadent, became the, the height of fashion in Palermo in the 80s. So you had the pirate with his pint and these arty uh, types and uh, every company from uh, all over Italy that would tour Italy and would come to Palermo to play at the Teatro Massimo, Teatro Biondo, they would come and see the boy, which... Um, did so that uh, I started my career in legitimate theatre. Because from there, they saw me. By then I had started playing other clubs and uh, my act became more and more political. And in fact, I was, I was then involved in other, in, in other theatrical uh, adventures. I even went into local television. And uh, I must add that all of this I did for a year, more or less, totally secret, keeping it secret from my parents. Uh, they had no idea. My mother was uh, questioning me sometimes for coming back home late with red eyes. She thought I was doing drugs. I was just scrubbing my eyes from the makeup and hiding everything under my bed. And so there, there was this moment until one morning I was sleeping in my bed and my mother opens the eyes. She throws something on my face and I get it. And uh, there was an article on the Giornale di Sicilia on the Wonder Boy of the cabaret scene. And that's how she found out. And after a big, tragic, bust-up moment, yeah, that's how they found out that their son was a cabaret artist and not a drug addict. She said, oh, she seemed to be angry for some reason. <laughs> so yes, so through that, then I had many experiences in theatre. So but what happened was that I had, I, I came from this very Ill, uh, wrong side of the tracks kind of background but I was embraced by legitimate theatre and people. I, I, early on I worked with Duilio del Prete, who was like a, a big actor of the, of the 70s and 80s. So he took me with him and I went to Rome and we did, uh, um, we did classics. And um, so, so I, you know, I had this ex experience in legitimate theatre. And I had the two things going together at the same time. So this, the lofty stuff and the, and the, more, uh, the more cabaret aspect of life, which I've, I've always retained to this day. I, I love to do both and I love to, to entertain both audiences and all, etc. So, um, but the thing is that my voice was never really um, used to its full uh, singing potential um, for, for a long time. I mean, apart from this early cabaret thing, but even those, I mean, it was always used as a, as a comedy device or as a uh, Cabra entertainment. I, I, it was when I got to London that I got to sing properly, as a, as a singer, you would say. And for five years only, I've been a singer as, as such. I have sung outside of a stage show only for five years, which, you, you know, if you think about it, somebody my grand age is uh, very, very little. <laughs> um, in fact, I started singing when my voice would be in decline towards, you know, would be considered in decline for classical singers, the beginning of the, of, of the, the, of the decline. But um, I am not a countertenor. I am not, um, um, I, I don't really know what I am because I use the entirety of my range, all of it, from low bass notes up to the highest ones I can achieve today. Um, so um, that 
wouldn't be considered a countertenor. Also, um, the upper register, it's a falsetto. I'm a falsettist, really. It's quite shriek, quite forward. Um, I can reproduce the countertenor sound every now and then if I, if I want to, but I avoid it because I think countertenors are, are amazing at what they do. They are there, they do their thing. So it's that kind of thing. I, um, and also I do a lot of damage to my voice because I do things that no singer should do. I'm not going to go into detail in what they are, but even the way I use it, I'm not, I'm not afraid to scream on, or to sing without the diaphragm. So I know that it's going to deteriorate a lot more than any, than any singer, but I don't have to sing classical repertoire. I sing only original material, either written by me or for me. So, you know, I, I, am, I am it. If anybody wants to sing these songs, they would love to refer to the way I've done them before. So there is the Tom Waits option someday. You know, if I end up like that, I can still sing this song and I'm going to sell it and I'm going to be fine, you know. So <laughs> I, I, don't, have, I don't, don't worry about the countertenor tradition or, or anything like that.